Anthony Frank Razum Pereira. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo recently held a video conference with his counterparts from India, Australia, Brazil, Israel, Japan, and South Korea on issues related to the coronavirus pandemic. Pompeo and his counterparts discussed the importance of international cooperation, transparency, and accountability in combating the COVID-19 pandemic and in addressing its causes. The meeting also discussed collaboration toward preventing future global health crises and reaffirming the importance of the rules-based international order. This meeting comes in the backdrop of another meeting held earlier this month between senior officials of the four Quad countries. Quad meetings are no longer unusual, but off late, we've seen that the Quad countries have widened their scope and have added more like-minded countries, which is special. On this edition of The Big Picture, we will analyze Quad Plus Diplomacy. Joining me on the program today are Patrick Gerard Buchan, Director, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Abhijit Singh, Head Maritime Policy Initiative, Observer Research Foundation, and Vishnu Prakash, former ambassador. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this edition of The Big Picture. Ambassador, let me begin the program with you first. Let's uh, analyze what you make of these developments of, if you can call it that, Quad Plus. Well, first of all, the coronavirus pandemic, it is the is a global crisis, is a global, global challenge. It's a challenge which the world in our memory has never seen. So it, it is very, very important that all countries, because it has affected each and every country practically, join, every country joins hand to share best practices, to come up with solutions, because there has to be a global pushback. So to that extent, uh, I'm very happy that uh, at multiple fora, the world is uh, talking to each other, sharing experiences, and uh, the, nobody is calling it Quad++, plus plus, but well, those of us who believe that it's Quad++ plus plus, uh, also has had a dialogue on, on uh, the 11th of May, uh, where the principal focus was on uh, the pandemic. But let me, I came across, now let me turn, uh, be the devil's advocate for a minute also at the same breath. Let me turn to the press release that was, announced, was issued by the Japanese Foreign Office, because Japan was a participant. And I'm quoting the, foreign, uh, the press release, says, the foremost priority at the present is to spread the infections, uh, but it's also as important to check, tackle various challenges, bearing in mind the state of international order after the situation winds down. Also as important to tackle various challenges, bearing the, in mind the state of international affairs. Now that is, is the crux of the matter because mm -hmm. the fact remains that very few countries want to put their name to it. Every sec country almost is hesitant to call it a uh, quad. And, uh, you know, it is a situa classical situation of be or, be or not to be. Uh, it, the effort or the, the dialogue is still exploratory. Uh, we are tentative. Everybody knows that there is an elephant in the room. Everybody wants to dance around it. But the biggest favor that has been done to the Quad is by the elephant itself. Because uh, more the elephant uh, kind of behaves like a bull in the China shop, which the elephant is, the more the countries, uh, the original Quad Four, or what was known as the Four Democratic Countries, plus other countries, are now coming closer to uh, to uh, at least exchange views. Because the fact remains that the security architecture in Asia, in Indo-Pacific region, is inadequate to meet the challenges. Frank. Okay. All right. So before we address the elephant in the room, let me let me talk about another aspect. Abhijit Singh, uh, the inclusion of Vietnam, South Korea, and New Zealand, all, uh, you know, nation, maritime countries, what do you make of this? Well, you know, Frank, there's been some speculation around what's happened in recent days, and there's talk that, you know, because we've expanded the scope of discussions by bringing in other Pacific countries into this, namely New Zealand, uh, Vietnam and South Korea, that could this could possibly be the start of some kind of a, a broader initiative to to push back China, uh, the the big elephant in the room. Um, but but you know I would be a, a bit hesitant in uh, accepting that formulation, and for two or three reasons. First, we know well that these discussions were COVID specific. 
uh, what uh, these countries were aiming to actually discuss is response strategies, uh, you know, how, uh, how they are coordinating their responses, you know, comparing notes, sharing best practices, etc. And I think uh, the foreign minister, Mr. Jashankar, even tweeted uh, after his recent meeting that this was about, about the health emergency. He made it very clear that this was really not about China. But uh, but really about uh, about how we are how we are going to be coordinating our strategies together. I think what has added some girth to the mills is that from the U.S. side there was a statement that we did discuss something about accountability and transparency, which uh, is code for for um, countering China. Um, uh, so this brings me to brings me to my second reason that if you look at the recent policy statements by. Uh, Vietnam, by New Zealand, and also by South Korea, it would be very clear that they themselves remain very reluctant to join any kind of strategic grouping that would aim to contain China. For instance, the Vietnamese, they came up with a strategy last year, an Indo-Pacific strategy, in which they made very clear that they still stand by their three no's policy, which is that they would not get into any alliances, they would not have any foreign bases, and they would there would be no favoritism in their policies in, in terms of geopolitics. New Zealand has only last year recognized that a concept like the Indo-Pacific exists, and it has a history of being nice to China. With South Korea, uh, South Korea, I would say, would be the least willing to get into any such format that pushes back against China, because the South Koreans believe that the real problem really is in China. They believe that the problem actually could well be Japan. And in fact, in our interactions with the South Koreans, they're often telling us that you are too close to Japan for comfort. So I think that this uh, uh, the, the, this conjecture around the Quad Plus, that it could be uh, some sort of uh, uh, initiative aimed at uh, a China encirclement or China containment, I think is a, is a bit speculative. This is not to say that a Quad Plus is not useful. It has a great deal of utility, and I could speak a little bit later on what I see the uh, the utility in that concept. But as of now, it seems that at least as far as India is concerned, India itself remains very wary about any containment strategy. We have gone out of the out of our way to, uh, you know, you underline inclusiveness and also mention the fact that uh, we don't see this as an exclusive, you know, the Indo-Pacific is an exclusive club and we are not here to contain China. So I accept this with a, with a grain of salt. Okay. All right. Patrick Bakken here. This is where I'd like to bring you in and then, you know, get your perspective about what's happening in the United States because... It seems like President Trump is going out all guns blazing against China and uh, President Xi Jinping. And also, what's, what, you know, what's happening as far as your home country of Australia is concerned? Uh, Frank, um, firstly, you know, you, you, you clearly the world's media is seeing uh, President Trump and his, and his senior administration figures obviously really ramping up this rhetoric on China. Um, I would, my assessment is that, that that's the twofold reasons. There is a lot of anger here in the United States. Obviously, the death toll here is now well past 80,000. Um, people are look, uh, uh, two months have been locked away. They uh, are looking for, uh, you know, reasons and, uh, and answers as to why that is. And China presents a pretty obvious candidate for the administration to go for. I would also assess as we go into this, you know, the final sort of legs of this election year, you're going to see both candidates using China uh, as a, uh, you know, as a, as a as a tool in which to express their frustrations. Um, clearly, as I've said before, I think on your show, Frank, that there is a consensus emerging both in Washington and most importantly among the American people of the challenge and the threat indeed that China does present to, to the U US led rules based order. Um, I think in my home country of Australia, uh, a, a, census, a consensus has certainly emerged in the last couple of years not just among the national security and foreign policy elites, but again, among the broader Australian people. And what you are really seeing is this values-based argument coming in to the equation on how people see China and how they think about China. No longer that sort of luxury where people sort of saw China as um, a, a huge market to do business with and to ignore the values arguments. And clearly the actions that China takes both domestically and, uh, and its foreign policy challenges people's deepest sense um, deep, deeper sense of what is right and what is what is morally right and, and the actions of China under President Xi clearly um, make people think twice about that okay all right taking the discussion forward now you know uh, ambassador you touched upon this point in your opening remarks as well Manda Abhijit also spoke about it uh, you know extensively uh, as far as how this is not about China 
But at the end of the day, China certainly seems to be spooked about all this. Well, uh, let me cut through the chase. Uh, the the nucleus or the the core or the cons main concern is China. Uh, it's just that every country is, to a lesser or larger extent, a little bashful about admitting it. And uh, but the, all the added challenge is that every country is tentative. Uh, Patrick uh, knows Australia's case. Australia joined and then pulled out. Philippines, though not a member of uh, Quad, uh, had one position under President Aquino and a different towards China and a completely different position uh, towards China under Duterte. Uh, USA, uh, you do not know after four years uh, or after under the next incumbency how it will play out. So there is a if there are there is one country which has been more or less consistent that is japan and for reasons that we very very well understand abhijit mentioned south korea i was the ambassador to south korea there it again depends on which party is in power if the democrats are in power there is a certain orientation if the conservatives are in power there is a different orientation so you know, and I would like to bring in our former uh, national security advisor, Mr. Shivshankar Menon, uh, just the other day at a webinar which I was attending. When asked about Quad, he said, and I'm quoting him, when the Quad decides what it is and what it is doing, what it is all about, we will know what impact it has. I don't know yet what it is about. So, you know, uh, the long and short is that while we have a challenge, that challenge is growing. Every no, nobody wants to con, to call out the challenge because you do not know how it will pan out. No country wants to stick its neck out. But the there is interestingly a parallel between the formation of the ASEAN region, ASEAN, a Southeast Asian uh, cooperation which in the 60s. The trigger was again China. They were afraid of communism and uh, afraid of China, which brought them together. But now it's a different matter. So similarly, the concern very much is the Chinese aggressiveness. And each country finds it, and they each country has invested a lot in China. So I would submit that no country wants to spoil relationship with China. India certainly does not want to do that. All right, then taking the discussion forward. Uh, so Abhijit, you were talking about uh, utility really as far as Quad Plus is concerned. Let's talk about uh, the utility and let's talk about the positives and what can be achieved through Quad Plus. Right, so, I, so in my opinion that uh, the Quad Plus discussion could be useful in some ways. Uh, first of all, I think it's a, it's a great forum to, to highlight uh, ASEAN's value. And one of the things that I at least see uh, with the court is that while there's been a lot of talk about ASEAN centrality, we've not really done enough to, to highlight the importance of ASEAN. Take the example of the recent uh, aggression, Chinese aggression in the South China Sea with regard to you know, what they're doing in the waters of uh, Indonesia and Malaysia, as also Vietnam uh, and, uh, and, and, and their open threats to Taiwan. Uh, none of the countries, of, um, uh, apart from the U.S., have actually uh, risen to really, really speak for ASEAN. And I think once we have Quad Plus and we have Vietnam also in the grouping, this will, in some ways, uh, highlight that ASEAN centrality that we always talk about. So that's one. I think the second way we can do it is in terms of maritime domain awareness. You know, the fact is that on the Indian Ocean side, India has done a lot to to uh, improve the maritime domain awareness or the situational awareness. But we would really like to play a part in some security efforts in the Pacific, in the Western Pacific, because China is increasingly a player in the Indian Ocean. So it would only behoove us to, to have a greater footprint in the Pacific and having greater maritime domain awareness cooperation with all of these countries would, would be a step in the right direction. I would also say that you know humanitarian assistance and disaster relief uh, is, is another area that we can we can again have an understanding on. The fact is that we're now moving into a post-COVID world, which means that all of these countries, that the uh, poor countries plus other Indo-Pacific countries, are going to have less uh, capability, uh, operational capability, to, uh, to 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 deliver the 
to security goods. And therefore, if we have a greater understanding in the maritime domain on humanitarian assistance disaster relief issues, we could, again, uh, be more effective in, in, in providing those uh, security goods. The third area, and I, I suppose this is one of the most important areas, but a lot of talk now is that centers around this, is that uh, there is a need to remake global supply chains. You know, the, 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 all of the discussion now revolves around the fact that China has appropriated a lot of these supply chains. And can we sort of look at ways in which we can do this without China? So China has been untrustworthy. You know, the manner in which it hit the facts about COVID, the manner in which it has aggressively, you know, uh, invested in in companies and failing economies, including, I mean, I wouldn't say India is failing, but, you know, when we were going through a little bit of a blip, they were investing heavily in our markets. All of that points to the need for us to have a greater understanding, a greater cooperation when it comes to supply chain management. And I think when it comes to trade, restructuring of trade and the remaking of global supply chains, this particular grouping could be critical because the quad is really a security grouping. But the quad plus does seem to have the ability to be more than security to also look at a bit of economics. And finally, my final point would be, would be we've got to look at connectivity and infrastructure. We as these four nations, meaning India, Japan, Australia, and the US actually have lacked the resources to, to develop a counter to the Belt and Road Initiative. But if we have other countries on board, for instance, South Korea, that have a lot of resources, we can have big time. We have, you know, uh, we have uh, in, uh, in, in other countries in, in in the Pacific. We could do something with building building infrastructure uh, in, in this region. Okay, all right. So, Patrick, uh, as far as Quad Plus is concerned, what do you believe is going to be the focus going forward? And and you know, where 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 are the areas or what are the areas of cooperation? Yeah, Frank, um, look, uh, the first thing I'd say is, um, you know, on, on the Quad, I would remind, uh, I would remind, you, remind your viewers that the Quad began back in 2004 uh, in response to the Indian Ocean tsunami. That's a very important point to remember. It did not begin um, as some sort of grouping of, you know, the security diamond, as Prime Minister Abe refers to it, uh, to, to contain China. It did not begin that way. It began, it, it began like COVID, when we faced an immediate challenge and the easiest way to coordinate uh, from the, you know, the big four democracies of the region, so to speak, was to form a quad officials level working group to deal with the tsunami. The second thing I'd say on the quad plus, my, uh, my heart and my head are uh, somewhat uh, torn and in different places. My head tells me that we need to bed down the quad and what it's about um, and how it can, can work across areas of security cooperation and economic cooperation and diplomatic cooperation before we go expanding it. Um, so, so my but my heart tells me um, the more the better. The more the, the more the democracies um, and, and some countries indeed that, that perhaps are not democracies as we know them, Vietnam for example, joining joining the, the this so-called Quad Plus. So I think the um, you know again I, I'm a little unsure. My, my uh, I co-authored a, a big report that came out about six weeks ago on the quad, where we ran um, we ran surveys and we uh, we did a lot of analysis on on examining where the quad's at. So firstly, I, again I, I think we need to bed down the quad before we go expanding it. The other point I would make to you, we have so many multilateral frameworks within the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and unlike in Europe, for example, where there are two paramount organisations, the EU and NATO, we have so many overlapping multilateral organisations in the Indo-Pacific. I'm, I'm concerned if we rush too hard on a quad plus, then perhaps we, again, we only further expand that and muddy, muddy the waters and confuse what it is the quad is meant to be. That said, I think, um, I think the commander was right. Um, the quad plus could represent um, other areas for supply chain, um, uh, uh, sourcing um, and and again expand outside that, that sort of security sphere. But if we do expand the Quad Plus too early, we also risk having a two-track approach. Uh, again, uh, uh, I think the ambassador noted New Zealand only just came down to a, uh, to a recognition of, of what the Indo-Pacific is. So we have various levels of understanding on where the Quad's at. So if we go expanding it too fast, I do remain concerned that we that we dilute what we already have in the precarious uh, work and the, uh, and the diplomacy that's been put into the quad so far. 
you know that's a very interesting point that patrick is making ambassador there are quite a few group groupings within the indo pacific itself so baby steps is the best way forward at the moment see where the strengths lie see where, you know a swot analysis needs to be carried out and then we need, need to decide what really has to happen and really as far as india is concerned what should our approach be absolutely that is precisely what i was also going to comment on we when i say we the international community has an habit of overloading the agenda every forum starts off with a focus and then wants to do any and everything it becomes a mini united nations it does not work like that when it comes to economic issues we have a g20 we have an indo pacific construct you know which can take care of humanitarian aspects various aspects the the challenge and the strength of quad is first the good news good news is that china was very uh, was apprehensive about quad and in the first flush managed to uh, frighten countries or uh, to persuade countries not to join it we have crossed that bridge uh, already the at least the quad 4 have recognized and china has recognized that the quad 4 will be there now i think we need to consolidate that we should in my view keep quad as as a, a mechanism of a dialogue mechanism consultative mechanism on issues which are important and the most important issue is security and let other countries if and when they join i have reservations about uh, vietnam south korea uh, other countries because they have their own concerns but uh, it can by and by expand important thing in my view is that now that we have crossed uh, the initial period of difficulty we should uh, work consolidate the quad process we have already elevated it to the ministerial level and let us stay the course it will take a long time but i think it will become an important grouping which will focus on security and geo strategic issues you know uh, all right all right abhijit singh uh, as far as like minded countries are concerned are we going to see more cooperation going forward because the recent call that mike pompeo had also had israel in it so i mean this is something new that we are seeing this this could possibly have some potential well you made a good point the thing is that uh, uh, if you have like minded people with you and they agree on certain issues you're likely to make progress but you see we've also got to learn from the quad experience which is that uh, there are some areas in which you make progress in some areas you do not so the quad dividend actually does not materialize across all issue areas so when it comes to security for instance we have a great understanding with the us navy as, as also japan and, and australia in the eastern indian ocean but that cooperation seems to break down when we go to the west in the western indian ocean we actually don't have such a great uh, you know such great coordination with 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 the us just because we disagree on some areas uh what we have seen uh, over the past two years ever since two or three years ever since the quad was revived that there is a greater focus on security in the western pacific which is the, the south china sea and there is uh, an an expectation that india will somehow either speak in a loud voice about what's happening in that space or maybe even send in its assets somehow be part of the strategic dynamic of the pacific what india really wants is that some of these countries should be concerned about what is happening on the indian ocean they for instance china's recent forays in the iur the fact is the indian ocean region the fact is they are sending in more uh, intelligence ships now into these waters they are sending in the, we already have chinese fishing fleets but these fishing fleets are now guarded by or protected by uh, coast guard vessels uh, there is also great mining activity that's happening the chinese are deploying drones in the indian ocean underwater drones in the indian ocean region now all of this does not catch the attention of quad quad states other than india because they are too busy with the with the matters of of the south china sea so i think it's great to have partners but it's 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 important to generate consensus on certain issues and for india i think the challenge is going to be generating consensus on indian ocean security issues not right. get drawn into what's happening in the pacific because that would be counterproductive from uh, counterproductive from an indian point of view absolutely all right so what's the best way forward then uh, patrick Uh, the best way forward, I think. I think, Frank. Uh, I spoke of this earlier. Uh, consolidate what we have in the quad. Uh, as I noted to you, we uh, we at CSIS uh, just released a major report on the quad. I encourage 
uh, your, your, your viewers to go to our website and have a look at that. What we found is the quad, um, there, there is great appetite for the quad among strategic elites, but there is still this, this feeling, and the ambassador spoke of the Indian National Security Advisor's comments. He is still unsure what this thing is. So we need to uh, consolidate what we have before we go expanding it to all. The ambassador spoke, and anyone who's worked in sort of large multilateral fora knows the instance of diplomats and bureaucrats to try and go hard and go big, and then you lose what it is what you're, uh, what you're about. In terms of the quad, what we have, my view is, yes, we maintain the, this security focus, but we also look to expand into other areas of mutual quadrilateral cooperation, equally to counter the, you know, the incentives that China's BRI offers. So things like um, in humanitarian disaster relief, but also in areas of, you know, uh, uh, aid and donor uh, cooperation and coordination that the four countries can do in the region to dilute Chinese influence and also allow the four countries to get used to operating with one another. This is a pretty new concept for India as it's moving from, I guess, a non-alignment mentality to a strategic autonomy, uh, autonomous mentality. We'd like to see our friends in India, the great emerging power of the region, um, work work closely and get used to working in that minilateral forum. All right, and Ambassador, close the show for us with your concluding remarks. Well, you know, Quad, I think, is a good process. We need to give Quad time. Uh, I agree with my co-panelists that we need to stay focused. Uh, and the focus has to be uh, to to take up uh, the geostrategic view, uh, uh, geostrategic overview of uh, how things are panning out and how the Indo-Pacific uh, security can be enhanced. So take up other matters or other aspects which can add value to what uh, Quad is doing. But let's not overload Quad one. Uh, let's not dilute the focus. We have already invested a good 10 years. We are developing some confidence. There will be back and forth, two steps forward, half a step or one and a half step back. But China's rise is a, is a fact. China is not going to, uh, to cut any slack to anybody. I know no single country is in a position to kind of, we don't want to contain China. We don't want to snap relations with China. But we want at least for China to play by the book. And if that has to happen, then like-minded countries like Quad, like others, have to speak in one voice and nudge China to be a more responsible member of the Committee of Nations. OK, all right. On that note, then I'll call it a wrap on this edition of The Big Picture. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective. For